Welcome everyone. Happy Friday. Thank you for staying up late with us tonight. I'm Whitney Ward. Mark has the night off. We are tracking some wet weather for the weekend. Meteorologist Michelle Boss is in the weather center right now. We're getting straight to it so she can tell us what to expect from kind of a semi soggy weekend, right Michelle? Yeah, I think we're going to get uh, by with some drier weather for the second half of the weekend, but tomorrow we are expecting the widespread rains to return. We did have a brief period of some uh, rainy weather here in the Spokane and Coeur d'Alene area. Spent most of the day with just a few sprinkles, but some heftier showers push through uh, between 7 and 9 o'clock this evening, and those have pushed off now to the southeast, but we picked up about a hundredth of an inch at the Spokane Airport, Coeur d'Alene Airport, and a few hundredths more at uh, Fields Field in the Spokane Valley, about three hundredths of an inch. Again, those have pushed off to the southeast and are dissipating. So pretty quiet weather expected for the rest of the night. Currently, temperatures are in the lower 40s in Spokane and Coeur d'Alene, but a little bit chillier up north, 38 in Deer Park, 37 in Sandpoint. Temperatures mainly in the middle and upper 40s elsewhere. Here's a look at the next Next 12 hours, we should see some dry weather overnight as temperatures drop down into the lower 40s. Probably bottom out in the upper 30s around 6 a.m. before we start our climb again. But it does look like chances of showers increasing into late morning and early afternoon. You'll probably get a couple of dry hours on Saturday morning if you want to get out and maybe do some yard work. But it does look like the wet weather will definitely be here by early afternoon. Looking at cooler than average highs only in the lower 50s. Breezy on both Saturday and Sunday. Gust up to 30 miles per hour, but just a few sprinkles mainly across the mountains on Sunday. All right, Michelle, thank you very much. Well, this is one of the busiest intersections in Sandpoint, but today parts of it were closed so crews could demolish several downtown buildings. They were lost in a fire just two months ago. Investigators wrapped things up today and determined that fire was accidental. However, the exact cause remains undetermined tonight. So it was back in February when a fire destroyed two historic buildings and damaged a third at Bridge and First. It forced the closure of several businesses, including a restaurant, a salon and a chocolate shop and further complicating things. The city says multiple insurance companies are also involved in the aftermath. But now that the snow is gone, there is something else right around the corner. Tourists. I think it's going to be it's going to be tough. Of course, everybody would like to see it immediately back to what it was, but I think it's going to take a while. So the city administrator says the city does have some major concerns about what this could mean for the busy summer season. They're still deciding if they will have to block off that intersection entirely in order to rebuild or if it could remain at least partially open. Our other top story tonight, state lawmakers responding to claims that there isn't enough money for basic education. This after school districts all across Washington are looking to slash their budgets after a change in how basic education is funded. Just yesterday, Spokane Public Schools announced a plan to cut more than 300 jobs. So Krem 2's Alexa Block talked to lawmakers about what could happen next. We've made every effort to support staff and students by recommending reductions away from the classroom first. Many of us saw it coming. Spokane Public School leaders announced Thursday they'll be cutting 325 staff positions. The district said a new state funding model has increased state funding, but put a cap on the revenue districts can generate through local levies. Spokane Public Schools expects to lose $43 million in local levy revenue over the next two years. According to Senator Andy Billig, the Supreme Court has ruled that the state has met its constitutional obligation to fully fund basic education. He said in a statement, education funding has increased significantly over the past several years. He cites Spokane Public Schools funding has been increased by $73 million over the past two years through combined state and local levy funding. Representative Tim Ornsby says state lawmakers don't tell districts how to spend that money. I would say is that the legislature does not make those independent funding decisions that are uh, the prerogative of local school districts uh, to bear the results mm -hmm. and the consequences of those decisions. Lawmakers acknowledge the cap on local levies has created issues for some districts, which they're discussing right now in Olympia. That disadvantaged some school districts, and let's, let's remember there's 295 of them. They all have very specific circumstances that are different from each other. And as a legislature, we have to create a uniform policy that applies to them all. The state legislature is also discussing proposals to fund special education. Alexa Block, Creme 2 News. And next week, the Mead School District will present a plan to resolve what it is anticipating to be a $12 million budget shortfall. That special board meeting is on Wednesday. It is open to the public. It'll be happening at their district office there on East Farwell. That full address is right there on your screen. You can also find more information on our website, creme.com.
So last November, Idaho voters approved an expansion for Medicaid coverage. And this week, Governor Brad Little signed a law that creates certain qualifiers to that coverage, most notably work requirements. But similar laws in other places have been struck down by federal courts. So the question remains, what does that mean for Idaho? Here's our CREM2 political reporter, Casey Decker. Originally, Medicaid was a federal program to provide health coverage to specific groups of people, like those with disabilities. Under Obamacare, the purpose of Medicaid was expanded to cover any person making less than a number slightly above the poverty line. But a court ruling gave states the option to ignore that and keep Medicaid coverage limited to its original purpose. For a while, Idaho was one of those states. But then, Prop 2 happened. Last November, nearly two-thirds of Idahoans passed a measure to expand the state's Medicaid coverage to basically the Obamacare definition. The proposition was not an advisory vote. It actually changed the law declaring a vast number of Idahoans now eligible for Medicaid coverage. To make it all work, the state had to come up with a plan and get that plan approved by the federal government. The proposition directed the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare to draft that plan within 90 days, and they did in February. Meanwhile, the state legislature decided they wanted to make some modifications. Specifically, they wanted to make a provision that in order to receive this Medicaid coverage, people have to volunteer or work a certain number of hours. They tried it in a few different bills. One eventually passed and was signed into law by Governor Brad Little this week. Now, those changes need to get approved by the feds. So here's the thing. Work requirements for Medicaid expansion, not a new idea. Other states have tried it too. And the feds under the Trump administration have usually allowed it. But then it's also been consistently challenged in court. For example, lawsuits in Kentucky and Arkansas resulted in a federal judge basically striking down the work requirement laws in those states, for now at least. The judge said the feds didn't adequately consider how many people would be left uncovered because of the requirements. Back in Idaho, even though he signed it, the governor wrote a letter saying he had qualms. Mostly, he's nervous that Idaho's law will also be challenged, resulting in a costly lawsuit that's all for naught. So, where we're at now, Idaho Medicaid will eventually be expanding to cover more people. And as it stands, those people will have to meet work requirements. But if this law gets challenged, as other ones have, that may change. All right, Casey, thank you so much. In north central Idaho, people are dealing with multiple mudslides all along U.S. Highway 2. The Idaho Transportation Department is working around the clock right now just to clear the mud, trees, and rocks. This is out near Kamii. Several people were forced to evacuate the Nez Perce Reservation yesterday afternoon. Tribal officials say they were working to drain a reservoir when it got out of control. About 70 feet of water came down the came down the creek just all of a sudden. But we made it through. And they told us, get your valuables, and it's like... This is the most valuable thing I have. This is home. It's not just a house. It's my home. Now, Kamii has taken the brunt of those storms and the flooding that forced the reservation to declare a state of emergency. Right now, crews are still working hard to clear at least 10 different landslides. It's been about a month now since the FAA grounded Boeing 737 MAX planes. And today the agency held a meeting with airlines and with pilots to figure out what to do with all of those grounded airplanes. The meeting was a mix of pilots and safety officers from American, Southwest and United Airlines. Those are the three U.S. carriers that have been using the MAX jet. The agency wants to hear from those airlines and their pilots before that plane is ever back in the air. Regulators around the world grounded the MAX 8 just last month after two deadly crashes in Indonesia and in Ethiopia. Now, in both cases, faulty information from a sensor caused the anti-stall system to kick in when it wasn't needed. That ended up forcing the plane's nose down. Now, Boeing CEO Dennis Mullenberger is re-emphasizing his commitment to safety. Our team has made 96 flights, totaling a little over 159 hours of airtime with this updated software. They will conduct additional tests and production flights in the coming weeks, and we continue to demonstrate that we've identified and met all certification requirements. Now, two weeks ago, Boeing brought hundreds of pilots to Seattle and flew the 737 MAX engineering simulator in to demonstrate new software. Mullenberg says the company conducted similar meetings in Britain, Singapore, and in China. The Pentagon's transgender policy for military service officially goes into effect today. The new regulation strips transgender troops of rights to openly serve and to receive care if they transition to another gender. However, the Defense Department says people can still serve 
as long as they remain their biological sex. It's estimated nearly 15,000 troops identify as transgender. Multiple lawsuits were filed, though, after President Trump called for that ban in 2017, and the U.S. Supreme Court ruled the military could enforce the new law.